Welcome, Tom. I'm so happy to do this interview with you today. I was just kind of determining that we've known each other for like 31 years. And the reason I found you to begin with was that I have always been focused on the internal experience of type, whether it was MBTI or any of the typologies I've studied over the last 50 years. So when I came across you using NLP or more specifically Ericksonian hypnosis and the Enneagram, I said, I've got to go. And I did. And that was in 1992. And I'm eternally grateful to you for what you added to the Enneagram. And thank you for being here. So let me read your bio first. Tom Condon is an internationally recognized Enneagram trainer and author. He is a certified coach, a master practitioner of NLP, and has worked with the Enneagram for over 43 years. He has taught over 800 workshops in the United States, Europe, and Asia, and has many products on both topics. He is the director of Change Works in Bend, Oregon, and has been an adjunct faculty member of Antioch University and the University of California at Berkeley. So welcome again, Tom. Now, I was told recently the definition of an expert. This person was saying it to me, and I looked it up, and I'd like to say it about you. So an expert is someone who has knowledge and an advanced level of knowledge, which you certainly do. And then experience, like having used in many different ways, whatever you've learned in diverse settings and situations. And then the third is judgment, being able to judge and come to conclusions that you can determine based on your experience and your knowledge. And then the fourth is adaptability, being able to know with your knowledge base and the systems that you use, how you might want to modify it to make it more effective, not being so by the book that a true definition of an expert is you can and should adapt. But the one that I found that really fits you and is the last, which is the fifth that not everyone uses, and that is a willingness to go off book, a willingness to do something that wasn't done before and in your own way. <laughs> I would say you did that with the Enneagram and NLP. And if you want to begin there, please share with us what that was like or how you brought the two together. When I uh, first came across the Enneagram, I lived in Berkeley, California, and Helen Palmer was teaching there. And I think Claudio Naranjo also, but mostly there, uh, I learned about it through my friends, most of whom were therapists. And I did go to a class of Helen's. She used to do these 10 week, one night a week classes where there'd be a, uh, an introduction and then there'd be panels. Right. So I went to one of those, but mostly what I did was uh, sit with it. <laughs> and my friends would purloin notes from classes, notes that they had taken or handouts. And I gradually accumulated a pretty thick stack of them of four, four inches or so. There were no books. And, and we're not, there weren't any books for almost a decade after that. But um, the notes kept me going and the contemplation of it kept me going because um, NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. Uh, that's what it, it stands for. And it, it's a very mixed bag. Uh, uh, there's, or sort of two versions of NLP, one of which is kind of uh, 
grandiose. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the other one is a really smart uh, calculus compendium of uh, good methods for helping people change based on the study of behavior of a bunch of good therapists. And what the people behind NLP tried to figure out was what they all had in common, even though they had much different ways of describing what they did and the, had much different frameworks, much different you know, psychological approaches or uh, psychotheology approaches. So in those days, because, partially because it was a bunch of therapists who were handing me notes, the notes were all negative. <laughs> they were all they were all about your fallen state, you know, within the enneagram, the neurotic excesses of it, of your neurotic style, and there was nothing good about it. But yeah. it was it was really useful diagnostically, and it was, it seemed to me, aiming for something central. It was quite clear to me. I hear this stuff all the time about how sixes can't make up their minds, what their Enneagram style is. It was instantly obvious. <laughs> and there, there was a mountain of evidence, you know. And so that hit me where I lived and uh, made a lot of sense in terms of the, you know, the kind of levels and the kind of, I don't know, I'd, I'd been doing hypnosis and NLP for a while and you're dealing with people's subjectivity. Oh, yeah. And the, unconscious patterning of that and NLP was really good that way and it, it was good in one way it was good is similar to lots of psychotherapy and lots of approaches which was it simply assumed from the get-go that whatever problem you were working on was your own creation yeah. rather than something that fell from the sky rather than a a, a cosmic stamp on your forehead that uh, labeled you an eight or a six or whatever. Uh, whatever. It, it, <laughs> and the even the talk about it being solely genetic, I think, is uh, oversimplified and some somebody's wish fulfillment. Because for one thing, if it is genetic, then we've all got alibis for our behavior. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really both. Remember when we yeah. did kind of a round table, all of us as teachers that were there agreed that it was a combination of nature and nurture. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, you know, you're clearly born with a temperament. Babies are born different. But uh, what happens to you can rewire you in a certain way. And it, it always seemed to me like people were born with the temperamental potential for several Enneagram styles. And then whatever happened to them, uh, they kind of landed on one in particular. That was, that's, that was always my working hypothesis and still is pretty much. I, there's not gonna be a way to verify people's claim that it's genetic until there's a blood test. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. That might be a little ways off. But a, a, a combination of the two. And so then what really became the focus was working on the excesses of Enneagram styles rather than some, I don't know, chuckle-headed idea to get rid of them altogether. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's ill-advised. And it, I've, I can only think of one person I think ever did it, although I, you know, I don't know world history. But there was one Indian sage who I thought uh, kind of had it, Rama, uh, not Ramakrishna, but uh, Ram, uh, Ram Ram Hamar. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was he was the real thing. But for the most part, you know, there's a lot of fancy talk in Enneagram circles at times about uh, getting over the ego and getting past the ego, and you know by my standard response whenever I've heard that is, well, it, it's fine for you to say that, but your ego just hurt you. Yeah, you know, yeah that kind exactly. Of thing. Well, you know, Tom, with respect to kind of getting rid of the ego was an important part 
of Achazo's perspective that you had to identify what was in the way and the ego personality of that you had that would prevent you from this idea of self-actualization. Right. So that was the belief then. But Naranjo came along and said, you have to have an ego, but let's just work with the negative part of it. And I asked him, why don't you see that there are these attributes as well? And he said, because I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> exactly. And a five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the focus for me became working on the excesses. And those I define as defenses, basically, or I just approach them like they're defenses, not defense mechanisms. Those are there, too. But just as a state of defendedness. Mm -hmm. To a slight degree, to a great degree, depends on the person, depends on what happened to them, especially what happened to them that they didn't get over. And uh, going from there, rather than trying to get rid of the ego, that it just seems ungrateful for one thing, but also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also not tenable and also not not realistic, a kind of theological abstraction that people aspire to, but it doesn't really work that way. So working on the excesses of it then led me to uh, apply various techniques that they called in the NLP and various distinctions. Uh, and that was, that was really good. I thought the Enneagram really needed methods because in those true. days, in those days, uh, once you found out about your fallen state and your neurotic excesses, the advice was, well, meditate. Uh, and uh, the other advice was, uh, you know, do something else. So, sort of like the old Bob Newhart yeah. Yeah. that's on uh, YouTube, <laughs> yeah, where he's got a nervous wreck client. He says, just stop it, stop it. <laughs> and that was kind of the idea. But And both of those things work in a limited sort of way they just they're just not enough and when you when you try and stop something like a an unconscious habit pattern that you've been practicing for decades uh, you can try and stop it but you you won't succeed in the end and you might make it stronger to sets up a fight sometimes yes yeah, so true and don't you also see the way in which people can then take on the persona of their type whether they're accurately typed or not doesn't matter but they'll take it on and then make it their new ego but it's really their ego taking on the type that they feel they should be want to be or will make up for a way they are that they do or well I, I our mutual friend russ hudson would say if somebody wants to be enlightened, doesn't that sound like the ego? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It does to me. Yeah, yeah. me too. Uh, well, people will over-identify with it sometimes. And there's a, about 400 ways to go wrong with confidence using the Enneagram. Exactly. And, you know, it depends on the context. A lot depends on teachers sometimes, the, how adamant they are, for example, or how respectful they are. Um, and there's a kind of the theology that's sort of, for me, since I deal with the Enneagram of personality for the most part, uh, for me, these other distinctions are bolted on to the basic model. And some of them are really good and some of them are just so uh, overgeneralized and or overdetermined that they're... Um, I can't, I can't, uh, my question always is, that's interesting, is it useful? Right, that's really a good point. And what did you notice about your own type that you identified with that you could then see how Ericksonian hypnosis could help you manage that? Well, it wasn't so much the tools of hypnosis, although those are really helpful uh, to be able to access different uh, resources and 
states within yourself that are contra to or exceptional to the worldview of your Enneagram style, if that's what you're stuck in. And, but I did, the thing that hit me right away was, and uh, some other people have commented on this too, that something like an Enneagram style is pretty much an an open-eyed trance. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're in a trance, you're walking around in your life and, and yet you're only sorting for certain things and filtering for certain things and uh, ignoring others, deleting others or overgeneralizing or whatever. But in doing that, you know, you, you miss out on the other eight ninths of reality, for one thing. That's a big and, one. And, and then people will, you know, learn about the Enneagram. They'll over-identify with their Enneagram style or another Enneagram style that's wrong, but connected maybe. Yeah. But um, there's, like I said, there's lots of, lots of ways to go wrong with confidence. I call it educated bigotry, what people lapse into sometimes. Bigotry means mistaking the part for the whole. So yeah. they'll say, you know, what's your Enneagram type? You know, <laughs> what's the Enneagram type of Luke Skywalker and Star Wars? You know, that kind of thing. And it may be, I, I'm, I'm sounding a little obnoxious, but it may actually be a function of the, where the person's, the stage the person is at learning the Enneagram. Yes. Because it's, it's easy to initially apprehend, but it's difficult to master. And people wind up getting kind of obsessed with it for a while. And that's a function of learning. And then the other function that going wrong with it serves is, if you think about it, it's really your ego's job to defeat the Enneagram, to normalize even a tsunami of insights about yourself and work them into some sort of storyline, that existing storyline. And so people will do that a lot. They'll over-identify, they'll reify as they as they say they'll over identify with their enneagram style and i met one guy who was a six who was a teacher actually who i i liked very much we were at a conference together and uh, almost every other statement he made was ended with because i'm a six <laughs> or began with because i'm a six and I, you know i heard this for a couple of days and finally i turned to him and said you know there's really no such thing as sixes meditation is just a way of talking about it but people will do that a lot they'll 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 defang it they'll join a an enneagram club of some kind and then within that there's a sense of membership and a shared vocabulary but also people typecast one another within a social context when everybody knows the enneagram oh she's you know pouring him a drink oh she's our two you know, ha ha ha. She is or point. isn't. <laughs> well, maybe she is or she isn't, but maybe she is. But even so, the reinforcement of it, you know, assignment of it, essentially, uh, you're you're being assigned to stay the same, not to change. The other thing I liked about NLP, uh, which is unique to NLP, was that they break things down in terms of the senses, and what it means the you know, the, the senses we all know, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. The thesis is, and the, the experience is, that when somebody goes into an habitual state or performs a, a habitual action, like even opening a door, that there's a sensory quality to it and that there's a, a kind of background, almost a metaphorical worldview that goes with it and then almost a metaphorical picture of the self. And then if somebody goes into the trance of their Enneagram style, there'll be consistent sensory qualities to it. Uh, You told me one time about feeling a churning in your belly, and then it comes up your esophagus and out your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling, but it's not emotional. I don't feel it as emotional. It goes literally from my gut to my head yeah and that's I a typical to report think about it afterwards yeah right right thinking comes comes afterwards that yeah. muddled thinking as you so well, a, <laughs> a, a woman who's a, an eight who was uh, working on sort of containing herself as 
eight women sometimes do. Yeah. Uh, she said, I try to behave well. I try to have good manners, but every once in a while, petrodactyls fly out of my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> yeah. There's always, so she, yeah, that's a great image. Yeah. And what we identify with, like I always identified with a gorilla, a tiger, not, yeah. There'll not, be anim not a animal. bunny or a deer or no, no. something cute and adorable. No. Cute, adorable, and vulnerable to being eaten by tigers. Yes, I'd rather be the predator than the prey. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, and so those kinds of self-images uh, come up, uh, started to come up with some consistency. They're not, they're not uniform, but uh, it's not unusual for eights to have an, a, a kind of self-image that's somehow attached to being a powerful animal. Right. Or the other one is, uh, the third one is sports, uh, although that's much more common with threes to hear them using sports metaphors kind of embedded in their language. They're not, yes. they're not saying it out loud. And the other one with eights is uh, war metaphors. Absolutely. I yeah. can't even believe how often I use war metaphors. Mm -hmm. It's like completely unconscious and i see it in my son spencer as well and he loves sports uh -huh. and uh -huh. he will weave in things but it'll have that eight perspective and it's always a battle or i'm fighting this or i'm gonna overcome that or i'm gonna deal with myself accordingly it, it goes all directions not just outwardly but inwardly as well yeah, that was a great contribution, Tom, because at that time, no one recognized these metaphors that were used. And when people learn about the three using these sports metaphors and the eight using war metaphors, you can really see the difference between the two. Even if both need to win or assert, we're going to language it differently. Yeah, they're serving different purposes in a way. Exactly. And managing different fears. I know that Achazo originally saw the eight as less moralistic and put that on one. And then he changed it because the one is trying to control their libidinal energies, their impulsivity, because they could be wrong, bad, or evil. Whereas the eight does not, but we have our own code, kind of mm -hmm. a, not a code of conduct like a one, although that may be there to a degree, but it's a code of honor and it's our code of honor, not mm -hmm. societies like, like the one. So it, it, you can hear it in the language. And I think I shared with you that I did the research on lexicon long before I knew about the Enneagram. So when I learned the Enneagram types, I thought, wow, this, I already know these clusters, but now there's more to them. Mm -hmm. Even though I knew many typologies, only the Enneagram could hold all the other typologies. Yeah, people don't realize you introduced that concept of using metaphor with the Enneagram. And recognizing that when people are in their Enneagram trance, they're inside of a metaphor anyway. Yes, yes. And, you know, there are some methods about identifying your metaphors and then correcting them or, you know, adding, adding to them in a way that opens them up and allows for some resources. Uh, and I, th I think, uh, and that's, that's a good thrust, but I think that um, you have to not only include a verbal metaphor, like a story a person tells themselves, but also what the visual equivalent of that is, what the audit auditory equivalent, what the kinesthetics are, what your body, what your body feel like, both emotionally and then physically, and where do you feel it in your body, and getting really micro about it all is very grounding. Uh, and which is not something you'd accuse the meta, the the enneagram in general of being, no. but it is. But it is really 
there is a way to approach it that's grounded and sort of matter of fact and without reference to a larger spiritual aspiration you might have or anything else that is, I don't know, I always said, I always uh, pled with international audiences to forgive my baseball metaphors. <laughs> but I, I've always been trying to hit doubles and triples, basically. And occasionally it's better than that. And, but not a home run. Occasionally a home run. Yeah. But uh, still, it's it, that's more realistic to me and more grounded to me than attempting to become enlightened, whatever that means. Enlightened is a visual metaphor, by the way, a visual word. Yes. And, then, and people who are people who say they're enlightened will say, oh, I don't see anything. It's a transcendent state. Enlightened. <laughs> It's a transcendent state, but you can render things down in terms of the senses and it goes a couple of different ways. Like there'll be sensory qualities that are present when you're in your Enneagram trance or stuck in some way. And then there's also a sequence to it. Usually they call it a strategy in NLP. So somebody finds themselves suddenly re overreacting from within their Enneagram style in a way that's typical and they recognize it. A lot of times what that then leads to is an awareness that there's an inner state that's consistent. And uh, if you look at it from the standpoint of a strategy, it's like, I have my reaction, whatever it is, but the question would be what happened before that? In other words, what are you actually reacting to unconsciously within yourself? It could be a sense of panic. It could be a sense of vulnerability. It could be something that you protect, something that you tucked away a long time ago because you couldn't solve it. It was overwhelming pain or it was uh, confusing or it was, uh, you know, you, you just couldn't make sense of the world around you. And you locked that away and kind of gave it a a place somewhere in your subconscious and it became a shadow maybe. And the other thing about shadows, uh, I wanna mention in case I forget it, is that when somebody has a shadow that they're reacting to in somebody else, or if they're Enneagram style, they're reacting to the other person's Enneagram style and there's certain numbers that you just don't like you know, or, or try to avoid. What you're trying to avoid is the low side of their Enneagram style, not the high side. Exactly. And there's resources in the high side, but you have to get through to them through the low side, usually. Yes, I know that if we understand that, then we have options, possibilities, opportunities to see things in a new way. Now, I guess I lead with visual, so I'm thinking about what I can see differently, but I also want to sense it differently. And then I will think of how I might hear it. And mm -hmm. this is what I think was so extraordinary about what you added is because even if we assign some of these, let's say, occurrences more commonly in one type than another, it was still that all types with all instincts, or in my case, tri-types, would have any possible order of, you know, whether it's visual, spatial, whether it's auditory or kinesthetic. And it just gave dimensions that would remove the stereotypes of the types. Because even Naranjo said, I called them stereotypes. And when I was considering countertypes for all nine types after my research, the first thing I asked Naranjo is, why not countertypes for all of them? Because people seem to identify with the stereotype and not understand the countertypes unless they happen to be it. And then in that training, he was willing to go through them. 
But he said with the archetypes, which is what he called it, he said they emerged over time and that they weren't fully explained or understood, which is why he didn't write his book on the subtypes till 2012 and why he asked me to include his work in my work. And I thought, oh, no, you'll want to do it before then. He goes, no, no, no. People have added, and some of it's really good, and some of it is very confusing and misses the mark. And he happened to like later, like when did your book come out? You referenced the subtypes. Was that 1996? 94, yeah, the video book, the first edition. Okay. And he knew about it. Oh, and yeah. He, yeah, because when I physically met him in 96, he said that you were one of the people that had seen what he called the archetypes of the nine types in a way that was more accurate and that otherwise there were some key errors that needed to be corrected. Having said that, for anyone who's listening, it's true. <laughs> Well, the other thing about subtypes, the way it's rendered and still rendered, actually, I uh, I worked with Enneagram styles for a while, and it was clear after uh, some experience that there was a spectrum, and there was a high side and a low side, and there was, a, you know, Don and Russ came out, or Don came out with that uh, nine different stages three yeah levels which i did think was overdetermined and and i flipped it open to my own and it said counterphobic six was a a phase you went through <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> no 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 uh, it, it it made more sense to put them all on a spectrum and say you know counterphobic six is over here and then occasionally they can be phobic phobics over here occasionally they can be counterphobic you know but what I really noticed about it, and a mistake I duplicated in a way, which Claudio liked, apparently, <laughs> is um, emphasizing the negative, which he did and his uh, followers have done and uh, other people have learned from him and who are still representing his work. And th what they don't ever do is approach somebody's instinctual bias and or subtype, depending on your language, uh, in terms of the resources it brings and the strengths it brings, the skills, the capacity. Absolutely. Now, ironically, he created the subtypes and they are subtypes because he took Achazo's three triads, which Achazo called instinctual triads. Right. So that's why Naranjo called them instinctual subtypes. So if you imagine the three, what we would call centers, but Ichazo called triads, and then you have the three types, then what Naranjo did, and many people didn't know this, is he took the three triads and put them under each type as a more primitive expression. So rather than the yeah. ego level, more like the id level, if we wanted to use a term. Well, uh, the, the way I've heard it in the last few years is that uh, your subtype behavior is totally driven by the passion of your Enneagram style. And I just, number one, I think the passions can be modified. Uh, if you work with them, the, it, it's almost like the, the goal of good work is to uh, develop unconscious free will, you know, so where you're, you're, you're connected on a lot of levels and reacting in a fairly congruent way. Uh, but the emphasis on the, the fallen state and the subtypes and, and how they're driven by the passions makes them automatically neurotic. And, yeah. uh, uh, a yeah. problem and the, and then there's other confusion like you know self-preservation threes uh work really hard and are really successful uh, yeah except when you meet one who has issues and 
grew up poor and keeps going bankrupt. Something yeah. like that. Exactly. Exactly. There well, I have found in all typologies and systems that when it reaches a point of being overly described, then sometimes people can miss the actual elements of the type within the typology. I saw it in MBTI. We used to have much better descriptions because they weren't overly described. And the same with the Enneagram as people were trying to differentiate. They tried to word things differently, or maybe they're not a master or an expert yet. And so they're just rewording someone else's work and then they miss and describe a character that isn't actually a good representation of the issues and dynamics of the type. Now it was Naranjo who added the defense mechanisms, but what he said that was so important in my opinion was that he didn't call them mechanisms. He took the defense mechanisms and modified them to match the Enneagram type and called them defense strategies. And they're different. They're not going with the more rigid view. Yeah, that's true with uh, what fours do, the kind of internalizing. Interjection, uh, yeah. Interjection, yeah. The, the, they'll interject and identify with the interject. Yeah, I remember in one workshop, because I went to so many, <laughs> the opportunity to observe someone for an hour as you took them through their different Excellent. states. Yeah, that I remember one four that had both the negative and the positive interject the way Naranjo first described from the standpoint that she talked about her father, how he didn't pay attention to her. He didn't treat her like she was special. She never had time with him. And, and he's still with her. And couldn't think, yes, exactly. And couldn't think of anything nice to say about him and within that same time frame ended up giving the counter story without realizing it that's what was so significant yeah about how wonderful he was how he paid attention to her treated her like she was special took her for ice cream where they would have their deep conversations so yes but you actually would explain that with each person that was willing to come up and well actually people wanted to come up and have you work with them well i would zero in on the sensory qualities of the two polarities of the and get and sometimes I mean, it's not making things conscious is kind of overrated i think but <laughs> sometimes it's a start and in doing this i you know have people kind of focus in on, okay, what's it like when you, you're mad at your father? What's it like when you romanticize him? And what, what are some of the sensory qualities that are different? You know, when in the dark one, it might be dark. Uh, the other one might be light. There might be a glow around the father's hair. You know, it could be a lot of things. And then body feelings and all the rest of it. But the, the sensory qualities, a person will start to realize with some encouragement, oh, this is all happening in a theater in my mind. <laughs> you know, it's and that, made up. And that we can see that differently. And I saw you work with nines where you would just work in such a way that their resistance would come up. And they would not realize they were in resistance. But as we observed, we could really see it. I mean, once I understood what you were doing in the beginning, I, I didn't. That first workshop, mm -hmm. as you recall, there was a two that was talking about Maurice. I still remember his name. I don't know her name. But I kind of said, wait, would you mind talking about what it's like being a two? And you just said, she is. Mm -hmm. 
And then, <laughs> then I got it. Why, when I was sent all the images along the way for the different Enneagram types, what they identified with, the two board was the last one for me because there were so many variables on there without a common theme. And yes, so you would get to the issue and the vulnerability of each person and the way to manage that, which I- Yeah, and their relationship to their own vulnerability. Yes. Is an, another way to put it. That's especially true with working with shadows or something like that. And maybe getting the person to go near a shadow. Uh, but, you know, with one way I've worked with nines pretty successfully is to uh, describe to them what it's like to be a nine. And at a certain point, they start to cry. Yeah. And what what I'm after is getting them, you know, sort of in touch with different layers and levels. They they say used to say in Enneagram literature, maybe still do, that it's a good thing to get nines angry. It's not a good thing to get nines I angry. I agree and, with you. And, it's and not leave it at that. You have to do more than that. You have to. Uh, get them angry and then get them sad because they're sad underneath the anger. The anger protects the sadness. And the sadness is a self who's hiding, and, yeah. which is also a problem with Enneagram terminology. You know, the person will say, well, that's my mental fog or that's my, you know, the, my amnesia for my priorities or something like that. No, no, that's not really what it is. What it is is you're trying to cut off your feelings from the neck down and go numb. And from the neck up, you might be obsessing about what you should do with your life, especially including various things that people have told you and various advice, you know, that you've solicited. Yes. And But it's a dissociated state. And you can feel it after a while if you're around a nine who's doing that. You can, they can have bees in their head and then from the neck down, they're it's like they've got a shot of anesthesia. Yep. It's called motion that goes with it too. Yeah. And also, you know, that I was talking about the sensory qualities. The, the other thing is that um, the person, when they're up in their head, they might not have bees in their head. They might just go blank. Yeah. Or, or see a wall or see a fog. And that blanking is sort of the equivalent of the body numbness from the neck down. That's, that's the visual equivalent of it. And when things are so deeply buried, there is a sadness because you, whatever you have to push down in a way is still a lurking variable. It's still there. You're still defending against it and spending energy keeping it away from you. And it uh, like you say it's still there and there's a self who has it which i find even more important in terms of it's it's not just a feeling of sadness it's a self who's pretty upset and they're pretty upset on the one hand for what they had to give up you know sort of like i kept revealing myself to the world and nobody cared and so i just gave up and settled for a 70 percent life something like that yeah uh, but when you get down to that sadness, you get a small, quiet voice uh, that says that, that maybe is suffering, maybe not. You know, the, the person could be on the fence about how much they want to allow something to happen. True. True. I saw that quite a bit with knives where trying to hold that neutral space or not really going into an emotion or not in an emotion, but trying to walk that fence was quite frequent. You know, the other one that I liked was with respect to the three, in addition to the sports metaphors, you shared early on that the degree to which someone that's a three invests improving or perfecting or becoming the ideal is a direct reflection of the suffering in the internal. And who they fear they are. Yes. 
Yeah, that would say a little bit about that because a lot of threes are missed because people don't understand that they think if they want to be successful, they have to do it in an extraordinary way. Well, threes can, but it's relative. Each three is going to be different, but it's more that they need to be doing, in my opinion, and having a good kind of image that keeps them safe. And the image has to be viewed as positive or desirable or valued by those that they want to influence. But you said it really well. Anything well, you want to add to that? Yes, it, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, the philosopher who I rather like, said yes. somewhere, he described these things as compensations. And that's pretty much how I think of it. The, the person is split yes. between who they fear they are and who they're trying to become. And they're confused about seeming versus being. They, can, they, they don't know the difference. And in that split, whatever they tell you in a uh, braggadocio sort of way or a, a big plans or you know some defensive image that they're hanging on to, whatever, whatever that is, the opposite exists. And sometimes the exact opposite. Yes. And they do it masterfully because they're trying to manage their world. So whatever their opposites are, the one they want to be, a lot of effort goes into because they're such hard workers. They're tough. Well, they're good. They're good at uh, uh, being mentors and mentorees, also. Exactly. And they want to emulate others as children. They pick their role models yeah. all on their own, and they want to be that person. And then if they're given guidance, they realize they aren't that person, but they can learn the strategies and whatever worked or they liked about that person. But the hollowness inside the three, you really addressed because the emptiness was always assigned to five. And that is true. Five, if they go in there, they go into it, they go into an alienated plane that you can see into the distance and everything's a little bit dark and there's a bird tree from the, the, from an area that got bombed. And otherwise it's just this long, wide expanse with no people in it. That's right. Or the five send me images of the universe with right. a person and stating how insignificant they felt in comparison to the universe. Whereas the nine is like holding the universe, feeling one with it, where the five just feels like a speck. And I love their upside down humor too. The way they, mm. they reverse things, like the bug becomes the big and people are little, a lot mm -hmm. of science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, the other one too, Tom, since we're touching on it, the seven and the kind of the self pres seven that people will think are eights. You had a lot to say about that that was really innovative in 1991, 92, when I met you. The, the thing about seven is five, six, and seven, they're all they all kind of project their will to some degree or another and project their freedom of choice. Therefore, uh, it's off on somebody else. If there are six, it's off on the boss or an a angry parent or whatever, a spouse. Uh, but if there are five, you know, the fears are specifically social, usually. Somehow, some overflowing emotionalistic four or two can swamp me and trap me awesome. and drown, yeah. <laughs> drown me in my own feelings. And then with seven, uh, the, the, the fears are about people who might be, or situations that might be judgmental or uh, limiting in some way. You're, and there's a part of the seven that when they're in their trance feels locked in a psychological closet. Exactly. And then all the, the, optimistic talk about their next trip to Morocco 
and their uh, other plans and new interests and stuff like that would be compensations. Compensations for a part that feels limited and uh, trapped. And, and incomplete, yeah. Yeah, and if they, you know, they might say that they're limited and trapped in their current job, but then if they go get another job, they could start up enthusiastically and about nine months later be saying they feel limited and trapped because it's not the job, it's something in them. And the anything that feels rigid, boring, too much the same and the obligation to that and then their fear types uh, which is to say they scare themselves that's a better way to put it than fear types yes and within scaring themselves they basically give away their power and don't feel like they can go near their own pain their own suffering that dimension of their life because they don't have the power to come back out that's not unusual Go ahead with the three centers. Yeah, and there's a there's a a self living somewhere in their body that you can get in touch with, get them in touch with, who is trapped, and working with that is really profitable sometimes. But also helping the person go near their pain and then come back out again is a really good idea sometimes. So to like, okay, go into it for and. To the and stay feeling your pain to the count of nine and then come back out and I'll tell you a joke. The purpose of telling them a joke is to take over their defenses because otherwise they could come back out and they say, Oh, that was painful. But you know, it reminded me of a thing that I'm uh, planning to do that I'm really excited about, you know, and they might defensively disassociate that way. But if you take it over and you tell them a joke, then it's it's better you have uh, you know as a coach you have a little more control in the situation then encourage them to go back in okay this time 11 seconds and what you're trying to do in the absence of their power which they've projected is you're trying to get get them to have their power again and to use it to go near something that otherwise was too uh, overwhelming and and then pull back and then go over and pull back and you're building a bridge. And that, that's the point really is to. It's so true, Tom, because before I knew people were sevens, I had other names for them, but I learned very early on that I had to tell them, okay, we need to tag what this issue is, but then come right back out. And later, I understood it was seven. Of course, they didn't want to stay in that state. No. And I heard, as many coaches have, what it feels like for a seven to feel like a bug on a board or limited and giving them a way to get out of it or tell them that they're going to get out of it or that they're expanding those muscles is so much more manageable to them. And a lot of types want to get the sevens into their pain and crying, but that isn't what helps the seven. Well, they'll get in their pain, they'll cry, and they'll come back out and they say, wow, that was a really powerful experience. Thank you. I look forward to our next session. And then they don't show up. Yeah. And do the other two centers. So with the head center, do you still say that in order to have my power, I must give it away first and then take it back? Yeah, or a bit or live in tension to it over in the other person. And if they handle it well, or they seem like a self choice, uh, a safe choice to project onto, then you can be in romanticized awe of them because they're more than human, really. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, that if, if they screw up in some way or they have a bad afternoon and they show an ugly side of themselves or they abuse power, then they're terrible. Then they're, you know, satanic. It, they're, they're not just godlike they're you know it's the opposite but still a romantic idea 
and the romance has to do with the the power that you've projected onto them. You're not even reacting to them precisely. You're reacting to a, a mixture of your own projections and then whatever they do. Now go to the gut type about needing to pretend not to exist, that you can't exist. Uh, I interviewed uh, one ape one time who told me that when she was a little girl, she broke her leg uh, riding her bike and then uh, tried to drag herself home because she didn't want to bother anybody. Yep. That kind of thing, where you don't feel like you're there or you feel like your needs are secondary to everybody else's or the, or the situation or uh, things that must be taken care of because nobody else is taking care of them. And within nine, one, and eight, they all, on some level, when they're in their trance, feel invisible. Yep. Like, like nobody's home. You know, like I'm an eight, and that means I got to take care of everybody else or take care of this situation or power my way through a, a, a treacherous world, that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, yep. But, I, but my needs don't really matter. I put those to one side. When I was a kid, I became a premature adult yeah, and, and stepped into a, a power vacuum in the family or uh, something. And then, you know, that uh, uh, intensified my eightness. And with one, you could feel uh, ones will also age progress. They'll uh, become little premature adults at, you know, age seven, that like kind of thing. Responsible. Yeah, responsible and ordering the colors of their socks and their drawers and things like that. You know, little. Uh, one woman said uh, that she, when she was a one, she said when she was riding around as a teenager with boys in cars, she was bored out of her mind and just just couldn't couldn't get out of the situation fast enough. And then she said, when I turned forty. I realized it had been my true age all along. And it was like my clothes all suddenly fit. Ah, yeah. Excellent. And that would be true. Mm -hmm. With How nine, it can, go, it can go either way. You can be age progressed or age regressed. Uh, the other age progressed one is uh, threes, usually. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's pretty much the one three and eight that are naturally age progressed it just fits mm -hmm. right in with the defense strategies as to yes. how you're going to be able to do and be whomever you think you need to be like i know as an eight that when i when my knee was fractured and injured at age 12 they wanted to call an ambulance and take me to the hospital. And I thought, no, I'll just wait till my mom comes. <laughs> I waited eight hours. She happened to be having her hair done. So they didn't know where to find her. But it, there's an odd sort of pride in it for gut types. Yeah. Even if they have pride, they have no pride. <laughs> it's still pride. And the pride of endurance is really, I think, part of it. And wouldn't you say that the nine kind of finds the way to go along one way or another to get along when they need to? And so the good child is the one that's not a problem, the one that's an ideal child, whereas as an eight, I could never do that. There were just too many things I wanted to go and do and be a part of. Uh, being an ideal child usually goes with the one wing rather than the nine with an eight wing. They're, they're, they're a little more problematic and troublemaking. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then the heart types? Well, there's, there's the split between, you know, seeming and being. There's the, a tendency to, a little more than other spouse, to get lost in a role of yourself, where you're, you're playing a role of yourself. And then the, I, I think, you know, we talk about anger being underneath eights, nines, and ones, and fear being 
or Russ would say, Russ Hudson, our mutual friend would say dread, yeah. kind of existential dread. That's, that's close enough. And then with two, three, and four, uh, people have various thesis about it, but I, I, I think avoiding a sense of shame is not, not an unreasonable way to characterize what all three of those styles do us to a certain extent. And with twos, you know, they're pushing away their own needs and relocating them in other people. And then, you know, it's like sending your inner child to live with the neighbors. You, you, uh, you know, kind of float over and send, send your, your antenna out to the other person, what do they need. You just realize you need a drink of water, but you can't just be that monstrously selfish. So you focus in on somebody who looks thirsty, you know, and try to convince them that uh, uh, to, you know, accept some water from you. And then when they do, you say, okay, I'll join you. Because <laughs> your water is in their water. Yeah, you know? exactly. And with three, you know, I was talking about it before in terms of the compensation for you know, when you read about Olympic athletes uh, and their histories, they yeah. almost always have, no, no, not almost always, but often they'll have some limitation that they overcame and it's part of their story. They come back, yeah. Yeah. And uh, with fours, you know, the, the, the horror seems to be of being ordinary. And uh, that seems to be equated with being unloved or unlovable. And if you're just like everybody else, you, you, you know, you have to sing for your supper. You have to, with all these styles, you have to do something. It's just not enough for you to sit there and be loved for who you are. You've got to earn it somehow. So it's socially conditional. And, you know, you, you said something like, in order to be who I am, I must pretend to be someone I'm not. Yeah. Would, yeah. Would you say that any differently? I found it very powerful, just like with the gut types to, in order to have my needs met, I must pretend I have no needs. And not like the right. two version, but the eight version, because you'd be giving away your power. But in the heart type, it's like the way the heart types have this fear of being ignored and distinguishing the difference between ignored and overlooked which is more gut type and the way i saw that is that with the heart types they've gone that extra little bit to have you notice and if you don't respond which is very painful to them they know it because they know what they did whereas as a gut type I'm thinking, was that intentional or not? It gets all mm -hmm. confused because I'm not trying to get attention and affirmation in the mm -hmm. way it right. leads with their heart type or reassurance if they lead with their head type, whether it's a book, a reference book could be a reassurance or now the internet is reassurance for some people or could right. be a kind of word or gesture. Uh, for two, three, and four, I, I always think of it in terms of, in order to be loved for who I am, I have to pretend to be who I'm not. There we go. That there it is. And that's the paradox. And it, you know, like all of them, they don't make sense, but they, but they once did. And that's another thing that I find important to emphasize is, uh, in the course of say coaching with somebody, uh, there's two questions to answer uh, initially, I think. And one of them is why. That is to say, I think it's good to link, if you have some recognition of your Enneagram defenses, I think it's good to link it to biography. Uh, the past is not necessarily the cause of your present defendedness, but it, but it is the context in which that got going. Yep. And making a connect connecting dots that way between overly defensive enneagram reactions and various things that you 
experienced when you were growing up and then defended yourself against is uh, that's that's one really good step. And then the other one would be not just why, but how. And how goes into what I was talking about before, where you zero in on maybe the sensory qualities of it. The person, you're fishing around for a sense of agency that the person might have in relation to themselves, how self-aware they are, how far they're willing to go to, you know, look in a psychological mirror and so on. And then various things that are really helpful within working with particular Enneagram styles that either mimic a kind of progression that happens sometimes in people's lives. Anyway, uh, the people who have shared the same Enneagram style, or if you as a coach know where they're partially where they're going, you know something about if you know their Enneagram style and you can kind of assess where they are, uh, you can steer them. It's sort of like a, there's a natural thing with eights where uh, some of them start to apologize. True. <laughs> and I've turned that into a uh, an exercise. Go run, be obnoxious, and then apologize profusely. <laughs> Get practiced at it. Yeah. And in, in an eight who's on a growth arc, that'll come up sooner or later. Uh, there are other eights who, you know, go to their deathbeds, not apologizing, raising their foot, boxing, boxing with God or trying to. And that was that that's the end of it. You're so correct. I may have shared with you that when I first learned the Enneagram and understood and immediately recognized the aid, I went and apologized to my three friends because they want the achievements so much. And I said mm -hmm. to this one three, I'd torment her every time we got cards and I'd say but you don't really need to stand in line you know you're going to get straight A's it must be no fun because <laughs> there's no variables and she goes no I really need to see my report card and then it's life and death yeah when I understood that about the three I had to go apologize to the three for that or the seven for making them go to their true emotion or I mm -hmm. apologize to everybody once I realized how I could be insensitive, whether it was intentional or not. And most of the time it wasn't intentional. No, it's not. You don't, you know, the metaphor I use sometimes in relation to eight, nine, and one is uh, bullfrogs. Uh, bullfrogs are provided by nature with flaps that close over their ears so they won't deafen themselves with their own oh. loud voice. <laughs> and the eights, nines, and ones have a, a some aspect of that, some similarity in That's their so relationship true. to their own anchor. That's so true. Yeah, when the eight will say, what, what? You know, I was just saying what I thought. Yeah, I was kidding when I made that death threat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we do say things like that without realizing it and just playing with the concept of it and pushing something to an extreme to see the humor in it. Yes. But underneath that probably is the vulnerability that was experienced as a child. And so you had to make it kind of a joke or you'd have to deal with the mm -hmm. feelings that would go along with the fear that we disown well and deal with the feelings for which there was no real obvious resolution at the time sure. so after a while you tuck them away you make them unconscious you practice your defenses like you practice a skill and you know when you practice a skill it. You get to a point where it drops out of your your awareness and becomes part of your system of reflexes. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes with working with the Enneagram, you're resurrecting that or bringing it forward, bringing it into the spotlight in some way. And I mean, the other thing about eight that, that was really kind of eye-opening for me some years ago was realizing that when you're 
uh, when you're identifying with being forceful, there's a vulnerable part, there's a split. And the idea behind that the forceful part has is that if I own, it can kind of smash this part and hide <laughs> it away and or maybe even kill it, then it will be safe. But we're killing some part of ourselves. Yes. To be able to do that. Yeah, and it uh, it it might have made sense decades ago, yeah. and now it's part of a, a a kind of strange confusion. Yeah, strange confusion is a great way to say it. I have one last question. If you have a few minutes, sure. as, you, as you know, I, I have taken the last few years to really want to help people that mistype for many years because they don't know how to see their anger, the nine, or they don't know how to see their fear as a six mm -hmm. or the image. Now they're all for the three and they're all three, the primary types, which holding the center itself. So all variations, but with the six and being a six, what would you say to sixes that could help them if they can't let in or share that they're insecure so they have to identify with what they do that they feel proud of when they're taking any grim tests or they're in a course to get there faster rather than later i don't know i mean you might say i dare you i double dare you <laughs> <laughs> i don't know um it would depend on the individual and I, I haven't, I've known some sixes who took a while to arrive at it yeah, uh, and bounced around in other styles, but not as many as other people seem to, to find. And, you know, if somebody is, I, I worked with a guy this morning who's a six and he's, uh, he's pretty earnest and, for, you know, pretty much going towards something and then decompensating every once in a while, you know, pulling back and, you know, saying, but, you know, I, I still scared myself that time, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, it just depends on how motivation, yes, uh, what the motivation yes. is, yes, the, yes. what's at stake, what the person, is the person really wanting a change or are they like a pre-contemplator? Uh, does staying the same cost less than changing or is it the other way around you know things like that become factors they become they become important and usually people change because they are suffering or making other people suffer or they're they, they'll change sometimes out of curiosity and a desire to explore the new um but Motivation. Motivation's a tricky thing. Sevens, for example, who want to explore the new uh, are uh, frequently conscious of that, conscious of plans and excitements and possibilities and so on, and unconscious of what they might be running away from exactly. simultaneously. Exactly. And usually what they're running away from is behind them. You know, yeah. it's like there'll be a, a pack of wild dogs over my shoulder or something like that. And so the the motivation to change is dual. It's it's one's conscious and one's less conscious, and one's positive and one's negative. Mm -hmm. You might have uh, you'd see the reverse in sixes actually. Where, they're looking as they're running. <laughs> well, or they'll come. They'll they'll say, you know, I have to uh, get over my anxiety, or my wife will leave me. Yeah. So there, it's a negative motivation. It may have something to do with their relationship with their wife, in which case you'd want to check for that. But the positive motivation that I find within sixes and that I fish for, summed up in the phrase, that's really interesting. Because yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, there'll be a, there'll be a turning point, you know, working with a six and say, that's really interesting. And they, you, you've sort of not not trying to do it, but you sort of tricked them to go beyond their own boundary already. Exactly, because they're going to prematurely stop because of their projected 
fear. Would you not say that in some ways? So they preemptively try to avoid it. And if you take them right into it, ease them into it and have them keep going. The thing about fears is you can um, microanalyze them with a six and they, they start to evaporate after a while. Mm -hmm. You know, a person has this big, vague, uh, <laughs> existential fear and you, you sort of, you know, get them to zero in on something and it's sort of like, well, it's this thing my aunt said to me one time, damn it, I can handle that. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can take what you were suggesting earlier, take a fear and exaggerate it to the nth degree. Because when sixes scare themselves, they don't go far enough. Usually. They don't go far enough, right. And, and it's each but, six is different, of course. But, and part of the problem, and the reason I say this is I created the test in a way that it was programmed for all the people that I've worked with, thousands, hundreds of thousands now. And the this new test has, oh gosh, I don't know how many now, but I kind of had to stop at 250,000 and take some off and put it aside because it was too many. But of the people that chose six, whether it was in the words or the pictures or the phrases, or the vocabulary, what percentage do you think actually chose six? And this has been a, a theme in all testing that I have done with sixes and then nines in that way. And it's usually two to three percent. And two to three percent does are willing what? To, are willing to answer things in a way that reveals their six. And then what they'll do is book a session with me because they keep going from authority to authority or person to person because they really do want to know their type, <laughs> whether it's in their community or whatever. But I say to them, oh, you're not going to like this. You know, that's what a six will say. And it's for this reason. And then they kind of say, well, I, I can see that reason. And then they understand the six qualities and then they might rebound and then say, but I'm not that. And, I'm, you know, right. in terms of the opposing force, they're meant to do that. But yeah, then they are. will, you know, identify with all the types. So their test results are like a poker hand. <laughs> nothing, nothing goes together, like a, a not a good poker hand. Yeah, right. Because it's, they're seeing many facets of themselves in testing instruments. It's not just my testing instrument. My, mm -hmm. The only thing different about my instrument is it's I'm using many ways to get at the data and then giving them notices, special notices, if they happen to use a pattern that only sixes and nines will use in testing instruments. Mm -hmm. And most people are kind of relieved, but there are those that are kind of furious and are in a fight with the test. Yeah. <laughs> like telling yeah. me the test insists that they're a six and they're not. I go, well, it's, it's actually just a mechanical programming. It's no one's insisting, but you made the choices that led to that outcome. It doesn't mean you are or aren't a six. But also, you know, that those tests will pick up parents, the Enneagrams oh, yes. to people's parents. Yes. And that, that'll confuse people as well. Very you know, one more thing I would say about sixes, uh, it's in the social subtype, a sense of mission. Yes. And evoking that, it's in it's it's in them. And it's something that matters to them more than their fears. That is so true. And evoking that or, you know, dancing around it or hinting at it or whatever, uh, all of that is a good idea if you're doing something like coaching or counseling, trying to get at, well, what, you know, it, it's almost like saying, what are your true values and uh, the, what are the ones that you would back with courage? You know? Yeah. 
That's exactly what worked with my son as a six. Mm -hmm. was if he felt something was really important, he could just put his fears aside and do the most courageous things. But he yeah. was not identified with his courage. He was identified with what if he didn't have courage? What if he was a coward rather than courageous? It didn't matter how many times he was courageous. The identification was, well, maybe I might not be in a yeah. situation. The yeah. what if, yeah. That's but yes, you, you absolutely are making such a great point because mission for the social six is huge. They go in search of a mission. One way or another, they might not call it a mission, but they're grouping their friends, the people, or the anti, if they're antisocial, they're still looking at it in the same way. Their mission might be to go against something that they feel is unsafe or wrong. I did a subtypes workshop right after 9-11. I remember it was in, and there were, it was, 90 people or something like that and we did uh, panels and i would you know get a bunch of sixes up there and i'd talk about the subtypes and then ask them what they identified with or di didn't identify with and there were probably nine sixes on this group in this group and i would say a majority of them were counterphobic rather than phobic like you know five to four or six to three Mm -hmm. But I remember at a certain point in the, the, after I'd finished talking and they were, you know, kind of revealing whatever they identified with, I remember looking at the whole group and thinking, this is a bunch of people who are, who look really put together. And whether or not they realized it or, you know, in their self image, like you're saying about your son, uh, that that wasn't clear, but they knew what they were, what they were about somehow. And it was, it was striking. That's and I, very, and I, very true. Once I'd seen it, I, I could not see it. I've seen it a bunch of times. That's, that's just absolutely accurate. And that's, of course, with any of the archetypes or qualities of the types, when we see it, then we can't unsee it. Like I remember a lot of the social sevens could seem like sixes if they had this swing and they might even have a similar sort of archetype. But once you made a few comments to me, we were talking about different people's types and you just mentioned a, an archetype. I got it. And then that never happens again because I see it now. I can't unsee mm -hmm. the archetype you recognized in seven that so many people miss and think of as sevens because they're colorful or flamboyant. And it, it's the stereotype of seven. And they're not fours either. They might be, but... Yes. Yeah, once in a while, there's a four that seems like a seven. They usually have a three wing. And yeah. mm -hmm. So, Tom, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anything you want to say in closing that you wish to be known? Or any events? Uh, I'm not sure when this will get out, but it's still good to know. Well, I'm doing a workshop with Russ uh, in a couple of weeks. So I don't know. This This might not be out in time for that. But I'm doing some other workshops, and uh, my website is thechangeworks, all one word, dot com. And I have a, a, an email list that people can get on, and then uh, I'll send them some nice spam. <laughs> and what's really great is that Tom has kind of identified potential people and movie characters that playing the roles of these potential types. And I think it's helpful if you see them all together. But as you've said, and I say, I change. Like someone that I might have thought had a lot of the characteristics of one type 
then there's something that happens where they're in the public eye and then you really see the defense strategy. And so I'll change. And I know you will too, when you learn something more. But if you look at it as just like an archetype, you have just lists of people as the nine types and your your first book, that's the one I was thinking of. You, how many movies did you cover? Was it one for each type? I'm trying well, to- I, I, That was the time I broke my leg. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, I had time on my hands, <clears throat> so to speak. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of movies, a lot of movies. Yeah. Well, and they, unfortunately, Enneagram styles were only in a some of them, like one in 16 or something like that, which meant you had to watch the other ones. Or they were <laughs> incomplete character. They or were they were the ish. The they were ish, like eight-ish, six-ish. Yes. yes. There's a lot of that people do now. They'll see a movie and the, the characters, it's sort of hinting at an Enneagram style, but it's not definitive not at all. They're the other side of this style. Yeah, or they're not, you know, it's not reflected in their actions or in their words or in their body uh, language. Manner. Yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's all over the place, really. It was the one, there were two things about the movies in the early days that really got me. One of them was I saw Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Frederick March from 1935. I know. And it, wow. Uh, suddenly I saw him turn from a one into a seven with an eight wing. And it was like, holy shit, they're, they're working, you know, they're unwittingly working with the Enneagram. Robert Louis Stevenson turned out to be a seven with a, you know, kind of a one-ish streak. And, and that, that really got me and uh, really got my attention in, in some way. And the other thing was, um, I hear a lot of debate now about whether there are wings, but I've always found it to be pretty accurate, even though I wouldn't be able to explain why somebody has wings. You know, that it's not. But what I would see in movies was a pattern where an actor would play a wing and then they play their core style and then a wing and the core style. Or sometimes they they'd connect to, uh, you know, there'd be another connecting point, you know, and, but, but wings especially really stood out. And I thought there was no reason to have wings, but then there was no reason to have a lot of things. And it, 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 it was really accurate, so. Well, one of the things that Naranjo said when he came back and started teaching after that absence of almost 24 years was that we always have both wings because to be our type, it's the continuum. Yeah. And yet when I was working with people, I always saw both wings, but still one was externalized and one was internalized. And then when I looked at it further, most frequently, if someone was an extrovert, they identified with the extroverted wing of their mm -hmm. type. And if they were an introvert, they identified with the introverted element of their type. So I saw both. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And that it was never a forced choice, which is what I've heard people complain about. You know, it's like, uh, I always thought about two thirds of the people that I met identified with one wing in particular and the other third identified with both of them exactly and you had both of them anyway and one would come out they come out circumstantially sometimes or you know we're we're getting up there <laughs> and uh you know things like uh, self-preservation might not have mattered when you were 23 but when you're 73 it does matter it's on, it's on your mind yeah. and uh, things like that you know where there's a where there's a shift. Sometimes somebody will start to occupy another wing more obviously. Yeah. Each one of them is a resource, and I don't find there's a direction of integration and disintegration. They're all they all have potential. Yeah. I told you that was an error in the dissemination of the enneagram that Claudio said he was 
He was just playing around, right? He was misquoted. Yeah, he was kind of playing with the idea. And the very same day, and he was with Robert Oakes, Bob Oakes. Yeah, Bob Oakes. Bob Oakes was a one or thought of himself as a one. And he loved the idea of sin and redemption. So even though Naranjo said, wait a minute, there can't be a movement one way for integration and the other for disintegration, because when the that would be dialectic. And the whole idea of Achazo's Enneagram was the trialectic perspective. So it has to be one, the other, and then the third. So if it's just one or the other, it doesn't work. And so Naranjo thought that he would just drop it because he said, no, 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 it it, it didn't stick. He'd mm -hmm. throw spaghetti against the wall. If it stuck, then that would be his theory until something said it, it didn't work. But yeah, he stayed with it and went around the world. And the one time I heard Naranjo use the word sad was over integration, disintegration, because he had met so many people that were typing themselves based on yeah. that concept. And you always do both, just like yeah. you do both wings, both lines, it's like a piston, like type out, back, type in, back, type to the line and back and it's nine movements if you include the type and mm. so I, if i could get a little animated quality it's the dynamic way in which the types move along the enneagram but we don't see that or generally teach that in simple terms well and the other thing is um you know people are more than enneagram styles exactly. and it greatly matters whether someone like a teacher, for example, is talking about types or are they talking about people? Exactly. Because <laughs> there's models about models about people and then there's models about people. And the Enneagram of personality to me is the latter, but people get dissociated and then it's, you know, the one thing I consider fortunate in my early training with NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis a lot of emphasis on the individual and the individual being, even if you know all these models, the individual being more than the models and also a potentially unique combination. And yes. then there's where they are in their life and there's what what is unfinished about early in their life or whatever, whatever it is they want to work on, whatever they want to have more choices about. But there, that's an individual, even though we talk about types all the time. Yes, yes. I see the types <laughs> as the idealized image, the core fears, and the defense strategies. And in a way, I learned that from all of the study I have, but it, it was confirmed by Naranjo and Achazo that you can't have one without the other. And if they don't match, if your core fears don't match your idealized image, that's what you're afraid of losing. Your core fear is that, wow, my idealized image is not holding up and it's a threat. And then the defense strategy comes into play to defend that. And we can look at the passion, fixation and convictions, but it didn't start that way. Mm -hmm. You were just a center not even a type initially. And then in 1972, and not early 72, is when the names were added and the fixations as fixations. But it was vices, virtues, and, you know, kind of the general themes for all. Yeah kind of systems or religions that looked at that. So, and then convictions, really, I didn't understand fully the conviction of the types until Naranjo explained that he'd kind of forgotten to include more about the gut center. And I said, well, I see those as convictions. And he said, they, yes, they are. But once he put the subtypes in the gut center, to balance that there was no equivalent, and then he kind of didn't pay attention to that anymore. But mm -hmm. actually I have a whole theory on that as well. But most people don't realize that 
the beginning of the Enneagram of personality with Achazo did not include teaching people a type specifically. You were just grouped with those he deemed that had the same central question, and that was by triad. Mm -hmm. Well, we well all... going from from the the big picture to the small picture is a way to do it. Yep, an excellent way. There are models about people, models about <laughs> models about people, and the people will sometimes try with the Enneagram to stay endlessly in models in order to defang it, I think. Yeah. Take away the sting or, the, you know, it's a way their unconscious is saying they're not ready for it or there's not enough urgency or motivation. And when there is, you can really go far with this thing. Uh, sure. I'm quite a bit different from the terrified young person I was. I used to leap off of bridges onto moving trains and climb hotels. And uh, apart from the fact I'd probably be divorced if I tried to do it now. Yeah, pretty I, well. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, it, or maybe it, no longer with us. And, uh, yeah, that too. Yeah, divorced in a different way. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that, that was a long time ago. Uh, I worked on it a lot. And I, I like to say my my major accomplishment in life so far has been retiring my inner jerk. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, you can go, you, you can change quite a bit with this. And as you do, you lift veils over your own perception, are more present, as they like to say, more, uh, they, they talk about essence, but uh, which is... Um, a hypnosis word to me yeah, yeah, but what yeah. it means is you're you're aligned you know and you're you're connected from top to bottom and you're uh your responses are proportionate exactly i mean if you do this work with the enneagram it's extraordinary the young person has a chance to have more possibilities, options, outcomes. And I know that I probably would not go swimming on a red flag day with waves that had a 10 foot face like I did when I was six with right. no fear. But, I, but the motivation was not that I wanted to go out into waves with riptides that were dangerous. It was that I wanted to ride my kickboard. And I went where I could secretly go ride my kickboard. But of course, it sucked me out. I wasn't afraid till I realized there was seaweed under me. Oh. The waves were crashing. And I knew that's where the moray eels were. And then I go, yeah, I don't want to get near that seaweed. And it would pound on me. But that's when the fear came up, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, but a little, a little late. Yes. A little late, exactly. It's such a great kind of analogy, isn't it? The, I didn't realize it, but the need, the desire to—I wasn't going to let those waves interfere with my riding my kickboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> little foam kickboard. <laughs> so, so childish, but yes, symbolically those qualities are still there, but I can be more aware of them and interrupt them and not need to make that demand of myself or others. And I can delay gratification too, or the immediate impulse to do what I want. Mm -hmm. and being denied what right. I want to do is the more upsetting thing. Mm -hmm. You you showed them. Yeah, <laughs> just, I showed them. Like... <laughs> as as the lifeguard was playing chess, actually, yeah. was an eighteen year old boy that kind of saw this little head, and he was a powerful swimmer and saved my life. But yeah, but you know what I thought? I was a burden, and I remember thinking, I'm never going to put someone in a dangerous position like that again. 
I felt except, like, except maybe myself. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But I risked his safety because it right. was really a storm, an August storm in the beach. So, oh, well. Yep. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you very, very much. And I hope your event with Rusty goes well. I know it will. And let's keep in touch. Thanks for the thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you take care. Bye-bye.